the novel Brave New World portrays a futuristic and very technologically advanced society. However, separate from the society is what are known as savage reservations, lands ruled over by uncivilized and barbaric people in the eyes of the new government. Chiefly among these people are the indigenous populations of North America. My name is Matthew Dinier. We're once again going to be looking at the novel Brave New World through a different literary lens perspective, this time that of ethnic studies and postcolonial criticism. Now once again, before we get going, we're going to be looking over what exactly the literary lens perspective of this blog is going to be about. So, ethnic studies focuses on the unique culture, experiences, and history of identifiable ethnic groups. It also focuses on, quite heavily on art and literature within these groups. Now, postcolonial criticism focuses on the dynamic between the colonizers and the colonized in areas or points in time. So, we're going to be applying these ideas to the novel Brave New World. We're going to be looking at the dynamic between the world state and the people of the reservation, and how exactly they can relate to the real world. Now, in the book, we see that the indigenous populations have been kept on reservations, against their will, I might add. There is electrified fences all around the reservations that kill anything that goes near them. So this situation is somewhat similar to real life, however, different in many different ways. First of all, we're going to be focusing on how colonization has affected the culture of these indigenous groups. Now, we see that many colonist ideas have been pushed on these groups and that they are still heavily ingrained in them, even in the futuristic time in which the novel takes place. For example, we see a ritual happen when Bernard and Olenia first get inside the reservation. This is a ritual to bring rain forth, bring storms, in order to help crops grow. And we see that this ritual essentially involves blood being spilt in honor of several different spirits, but also Jesus Christ. So, obviously, before colonization, the indigenous populations of North America didn't believe in Jesus Christ, they didn't know who he was. This was an idea that was brought upon them. And we see that even in a future where the average person doesn't worship Jesus Christ anymore, that it's still so heavily ingrained in this culture that they still worship and believe in him. So this is a clear sign that colonization has taken part, and that it's been very, very heavily put on these people. Another way that we see that colonization has affected them is simply the state of the reservations themselves. These reservations are essentially just disgusting, untamed wildlands. They're not anywhere that any person would want to live, but the people don't really have any choice. They're trapped in these lands, and they have no contact with the outside world. They, quite clearly, a lot of horrible circumstances have come down for the situation to have gotten this bad. We don't know exactly what the events are, but it's quite clear that they're not here by their own free choice. We hear a lot of strange references to other cultures being in there as well, and the dynamic isn't fully understood yet, but it's quite clear that it's a forced situation with the electrified fences, and the intrusions by the world state occasionally to research or to view them simply as pets, or some type of zoo animals almost. We see that much like in real life, the indigenous populations are being treated horribly by the government. We hear a reference from one of the people that runs the reservation, the people from the world state, say that the populations have had enough experiences with gas bombs to know not to act out. This is quite clearly a sign that in the past they may have either tried to leave or have tried to act in a way that somehow would hurt the interests of the world state and that they were met with military force. Much like how in real life, when reservations try and fight for their rights, they get attacked by the government. This is a horrible reality, but one that is true both in the book and in real life. Now we have some other ideas going on that connect to real world things as well. We see that the state of the reservation is absolutely abysmal, nobody would want to live there. It's a horrible situation. Much like how in real life we have reservations where there is like no drinkable water, the situations just aren't good in the book and in real life. Another point to make is that the way the cultures are portrayed in the book may not be entirely, <clears throat> entirely accurate to real life. We see that they do blood sacrifices, we see that they act very brutal to one another, we see them using whips, which is also a colonist influence perhaps being put upon them. And it's really hard to tell at times if this is simply an idea of how the book is showing that the treatment of these people has led to them becoming barbaric, or if it's simply a dated view from when the novel is written. But either way, they're still being portrayed in a brutal manner, a very strange way. 
So, in conclusion, to wrap things up, we see the dynamic going on between the world state and the indigenous people as being one where the indigenous people are quite clearly being oppressed and mistreated. We also see that this has similarities to real life, both in the state of the reservation and in the government interference that goes on. The government interference that only happens when it aids the government, but not when it aids the people of the reservation. We also see that the portrayal of these people is not exactly a good light. And it's hard to tell if this is a literary thing, just something that's meant to portray how horrible the government is in the book, or if it's simply a dated view. My name is Matthew Dinger. This has been my vlog.